at the end, you and Felix, of course, too, was referring to the companies who are owning this uh, uh, knowledge that they have agency. But sometimes I'm worried if the companies themselves are also victim of the system they are producing. So where is agency? Um, I think one of the advantages of really looking at actual practices is you can identify you know, sites and procedures and temporal sequences, how these things come about. And you see how deeply contextualized and embedded in you know, ideological, institutional, cultural, economic frameworks these things are. And often, if you cannot get access to the technology because it's opaque, because it's hidden under lots of layers and non-disclosure agreements and is rapidly changing, you can still get access to these other elements that are inseparable. So you cannot separate the technology from the environment in which it is being developed and used. And if you cannot get access to the technology, for all kinds of reasons, you can still get access to that environment. So I think often in terms of a, of a kind of political perspective, the focusing on, on kind of the power of the technology and the mysteriousness of the technology is also a way of avoiding to speak about a lot of other things. And for a lot of people, um, technology in this, in this sense of a very advanced kind of infrastructure, not, not kind of simple technology, but complex infrastructural technology, it's really hard to get access to. But it doesn't mean that you cannot influence it, but you have to perhaps, you know, shift the layer or shift the, the layer on which you act. I'm um, going to see if this is working. I'm, I'm going to be really honest with you, Bern, is that I think that when we talk about agency, it is very uh, seductive to think that we have agency by somehow opening up the black boxes or truly understanding them. I, I don't think either Trevor or I would really necessarily buy that. I think our sense is that um, the, the mythos of individual agency is very profoundly threatened by systems like this. And that in fact, at the level of the individual, there's actually very little you can do. And, and this is why I think debates like, well, just quit Facebook, is really just, it's, it's completely avoiding the much bigger problem, which is that even if you do quit Facebook, Facebook has you know, a little setting for you because it knows all of your friends and is already making assumptions about your preferences, what you do, even if you're not there. So my sense is that this takes us back to the question of collective agency and how do we start thinking about political agency for what is essentially a set of structural problems. But in order to build up this collective agency, don't, don't you need uh, resources only the big companies have in order to address the issues they are producing? Well, I, I mean, again, I think the question of how we have always expressed collective agency gets to the level of how we define politics. And it's really hard right now to think about how traditional forms of protest are not also ingested by these systems. I mean, right now, um, I'm based in New York City and the NYPD has given itself free license to use drones wherever it wants all of the time to collect images. So if you go to a protest, the likelihood that you are going to be recorded, that you are going to be recognized, is now very high indeed. So how do you start expressing political resistance? And I think there have been some really exciting signs in the fact that we're actually starting to see protests inside technology companies. We can look to the walkout of 20,000 Google workers uh, just last year. But I think we're going to need to do a lot more. But uh, one of the points of Felix was that by now we are so entangled in these technological systems that you never know what it means what you do. So how is political engagement at all possible because you never know what the frames are you are operating in? That's a really complicated question. Um, but I do, I want to come back to this, the, something that both of you guys were looking at to a various, various degrees, which is kind of deliberately creating spaces that are inefficient, right? Almost like deliberately creating 
blind spots. And I know this is some of the recommendations that you make in the, or some of the policy work that you guys are doing, which is looking at, hey, maybe municipalities should not be using algorithms that are not auditable in order to do, you know, sentencing in criminal justice systems. I mean, that's a very specific example, but we can imagine the creation of, you know, saying that there are certain parts of society, particularly when it comes to public services and public goods, that we're just not going to use these systems within. You know, that could be applied to policing as well. And historically, we've done that. That's what a fucking warrant is, right? I mean, so, I mean, it's perfectly possible to kind of create these kind of spaces. And I think that's related to what you're talking about as well in terms of trying to imagine creating spaces where other forms of communication are possible as well. And, and I think that's a powerful way to start imagining it. It's, it's thinking about not so much as the creation of agency, so much as the, the creation of yeah. different spaces. Uh, different spaces. Uh, would that mean uh, that uh, you discard tec the technologies or you use technologies for different ends? I think that you would discard them entirely would be the idea. But the point is that there are certain kinds of political logics that are built, that are hard coded into the technologies that you that are that you cannot get around, right? And so the question is, do we want to have sectors of the society that are not subject to those logics or those political operations that are literally built into the technology itself? Yeah, I mean, two points simply because you you mentioned. Um, you know, cities should not engage using certain, you know, algorithms that they cannot um, you know, control. A very small story from a um, city in Sweden that um, hired a company to make their, you know, traffic lights more efficient. So they said, yeah, we have these, you know, complex um, algorithms that will regulate the flow. No, you can't look at them. They're too complicated in their math and you cannot understand math. So they did it because they had a proven track record and whatnot. And indeed, the traffic flowed more efficiently. But what they found out was that it completely went against their idea of how they wanted to manage the traffic. Because it was, because it was, be okay, um, is this working now? Yeah, okay, so it completely went against their idea of, um, how to manage the traffic because it now was making personal, you know, um, individual cars more effective at the expense of buses mm -hmm. because it was simply counting the number of vehicles throughput. So it was clear, you know, prefer uh, cars. And then they had signed a 10-year a 10-year contract they couldn't get out of anymore. But on the other hand. Uh, Related to that is, of course, the, the power question, because uh, in these technologies, evidently, there is inbuilt so much power that the question is, is the asymmetry to create, let's say, uh, technological free spaces to this power. Can you imagine that this asymmetry can be can overcome to some extent? Thanks, Trevor. Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is the hardest question. I think this is the hardest question. I mean, it's, again, how do you address a power asymmetry where we are looking at less than a dozen companies worldwide who can do AI at scale, really planetary scale AI? That is an extraordinary concentration of power, the likes of which we have not seen since the railways, and I would say even surpasses that. So in this sense, the power asymmetries are not only about huge power concentration in a very small set of hands, but they're rapidly gaining more and more insight and power because of the degree to which they can deploy huge amounts of insight into every one of us and into how systems work, including the financial system, including healthcare systems, you name it. So the abrogation of power and knowledge is happening very, very quickly and in a very rapid cycle. This means it's extremely difficult to start saying, how do we just like flip that particular asymmetry? I do think though that there are some really important conversations happening at the moment about regulation. 
and that we can actually start talking very seriously about how to regulate some of these technologies. Now, if you tried to have that conversation as recently as five years ago, people would say, oh, you're crushing innovation. That's terrible. Um, I, I think it's extraordinary that now even technology companies, even the sort of the really big six in the US, are calling for regulation. So we've seen a shift. So they are worried themselves <laughs> about what they do. <laughs> Great. Uh, <laughs> one has to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, perhaps my last question here uh, for the uh, podium before we go uh, give the questions to the floor would uh, relate our discussion to the political situation we have. Because basically uh, what you were uh, showing in your presentations is that there is a deep interference in the traditional ways we understand subjectivity, we understand society, we understand community. It's really transforming this. This is one thing. And the second thing Felix was especially uh, uh, relating to uh, was this completely commodification of all social actions and thereby of individuality or subjectivities. So is that the real reason for the right-wing parties coming up at the moment because people realize they become objects of processes they can't control anymore. Uh, and they are just, yeah, the victims of these processes. Um, and how could we, yeah, what, what could be done on this? Um, I think this is, yeah, obviously <laughs> a really complicated question. But um, I think there are several elements that come together that make this particular hard to address. I mean, we, I think on the one hand, we have a, um, an explosion of complexities that existing social institutions are really bad at addressing. Like representative democracy um, assumes that there is a, that there are relatively large homogeneous groups that you can represent. So, um, this is one of the of, of, of the problems we have. Um, the other one is that within this this kind of um, opening of or, or, or lack of of, con of of ability to to you know articulate effective kind of a political will in these existing institutions, new institutions have sprung up that are doing it for us, so to speak. And they are using very powerful technologies that makes it even more difficult to understand what it is actually that they're using. So they, there really is a new regime displacing an, a, an old one that is, you know, has been kind of in a crisis for a long time. If you just look, you know, say since the 70s or the 60s or whatever you, uh, where you want to, to put uh, you know, the date on. But until maybe the 2000s, these systems were in crisis, but there was really nothing that could replace them. So you were, you were stuck in a situation that we were watching TV and thinking this is really a shitty program, but there was nothing else to watch. There was just TV. And now, you know, after 2000, you have an explosion of other possibilities that are rapidly consolidating in very, very powerful organization. So we, are, we have two tasks at the same time. On the one hand, we have to uh, you know, reinvent what democracy under radically different conditions, and I don't mean AI here, I just mean different social conditions, different subjectivities, um, that people you know, who are employed in one company are not all workers in the sense that they were in the factory. So, so there's really a, a, a dramatic uh, explosion of complexity and, and we need to invent democratic institutions that can address that because what we have now is kind of very undemocratic institutions that are very good at addressing it. 